welcome to this week's episode of Liberty Chat, brought to you by the Liberal Democrats. Welcome everyone to this week's episode of Liberty Chat, our weekly roundup of all things libertarian related, liberty related, Liberal Democrats related from around the country uh, and our campaign goings on as well. You may see a different face here tonight. My name is Kirsty O'Sullivan. We have Kanelm Tonkin here replacing David Limbrick tonight. Hi, Kanelm. Hi. Is our lead Senate candidate in South Australia. And we also have regular panelist Campbell Newman in Queensland, lead Senate candidate. G'day all. And John Ruddock, lead Senate candidate for New South Wales. Hi, John. So one of the reasons we don't Hello, have... Hello, everybody. Oh, sorry, we had a bit of a delay then. Sorry, John. Um, one of the reasons we don't have uh, David Limbrick here tonight is that he's been in Parliament and tonight, in, today in Victorian Parliament has been a real doozy. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I don't know any, why anyone needs reality TV. You just watch Parliament. So... Um, I've been sort of just trying to catch up over the last few hours. It's been a very, very busy day. But basically, uh, Adam Somarek, who's brought in um, a motion about bringing in the IBAC discussion on the red shirts with Labor corruption that's been happening here in Victoria, he managed to get this vote through 1917 across the floor with a move by one of the Labor MPs, who is actually, I'd never heard of her before, uh, in the last three years that she's been in Parliament, but she did something pretty darn monumental today, uh, a Western Suburbs uh, Labor MP. But what this means, and I'm just going to read a couple of little things through here, what this means is that uh, Adam Somerek single-handedly restructured the Victorian Upper House to widen the crossbench and remove a key vote from the government in an election year, and they'll now struggle for the rest of the year to pass legislation. So it's pretty epic. And obviously, our Tim Quilty and David Limbrick have been pretty darn busy today. There were some excellent comments by Tim Quilty um, about the Greens as well, and about how the Greens have no interest in draining the swamp. Instead, they swim in it while pretending to be offended by it. Great Quilty comment right there. So it's been pretty epic. Uh, obviously, we've had our the three crossbenchers that consistently vote with Daniel Andrews and the Labor. And of course, it was those three that stuck with them again. So it literally is this this one Labor MP who's done the most monumental thing and crossed the floor. Without her, this would not have passed. Without her, none of this would happen. So what this, of course, means is that the investigation will go through. And who knows? It's going to be a pretty, pretty exciting time, um, especially leading into the Victorian state election in November. We'll see what happens. Uh, well, that's been exciting in Victoria today. Cam, what's been happening in your world up there in beautiful Queensland? Well, I suppose just in terms of the political arena, there's uh, been ongoing uh, media attention uh, on the integrity crisis in the Palaszczuk government. And, you know, the opposition for the first time oh, for several years has actually been able to score some blows aided by a media that's woken up. So I've got to acknowledge that. Uh, and the Premier has been looking ragged and angry and has lashed out at journos and things like that. I've had a bit of fun in that I have issued a challenge to the Premier uh, because she has this thing, the standard, uh, you know, when in trouble, uh, reach for the big red button, Mark Campbell Newman, you hit the button in a press conference and say, oh, it's all Campbell's fault or he did this or he did that. So I, I issued a challenge like last week, which is that uh, I'm ready to debate the Premier in the next four weeks. The Brilliant. Time and place of mutual convenience. And uh, I'll debate her on integrity and I'll debate her on the track record of our respective governments. And now, needless to say, uh, she's not going to take me up on that, but I'm going to continue to prosecute the point. And there's been quite a few people in the media who've thought that was uh, quite, quite funny. Hmm. Um, and also, <laughs> my line is, well, look, you know, if you want to keep, you know, you've got a choice, you either debate me and you can continue to blame me. Um, we can respect that or you got to shut up in future because uh, you yeah. haven't been prepared to stump up. So that's sort of the political, you know, the political stuff. Um, you know, I just make the observation federally, our, you know, our real opponent for what we're about at the moment, um, the, the major parties, uh, well, particularly I think the Prime Minister's continued to make uh, silly calls, spending lots of money, uh, antagonising the base of the LNP, apologising when he shouldn't apologise, bringing the ADF in to 
um, uh, aged care, which I think has people uh, raising their eyebrows. And I think it's happened since our last uh, meeting, the, the, you know, increasing the funding of the ABC. Could mm. you believe it? Yeah. Um, so, some, you know, again, he, he just seems to be clueless about what really he needs to do to recover ground. Mm. Um, so I just make those observations. Just in terms of what I've been up to, just a quick uh, snapshot for people. Uh, since we last uh, met, I've done uh, Sky News with Bolt, uh, then on Cor with Corey Bernardi on Friday night, Paul Murray Live on Sunday night. I did 4BC Talkback Radio in Brisbane on Saturday morning with Bill McDonald. I've done podcasts with a mob called The Office Guys, who are some young blokes up here. Mm. They have a popular podcast. Also TNT Radio, which is uh, start to become a force. They're based on the Gold Coast. And uh, Nick Holt, who a number of people watching today would have heard of, uh, did his po podcast. We've also done a fundraiser today, um, on top of the one we did this time last week. This Friday, we've got a candidate get together at 2.45. Um, I'll leave it to Michael Pucci, the campaign director, just to confirm the details. But we're getting together for, you know, um, training and also photographs, team photographs for the campaign. Mm, and I particularly, just in closing, I really want to say big shout out to Diane Dimitri, who uh, had had to pull out uh, due to some personal issues, but she's back. So I love welcome it. Welcome back, Diane. I'm not sure if you're online tonight, but it's fantastic, Diane, that you're down on the Gold Coast because you were really running a red hot campaign, having a great go. So yeah. great to have you back on the team. I'm very happy to have Diane back. So she is running in the seat of Moncrief on the beautiful Gold Coast. She is a mighty powerhouse. She's an amazing woman. It's great to have her back. Um, so she's, she's actually she's actually running. She's, she's back. Running. Oh, she's back. She's a sensation. She's fantastic. There uh, we go. Ev everyone loves her. She's there great. we go. There we go. And Canel, you're 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 in big shoes tonight. You're filling in for David Limbrick. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what's going on down in South Australia, how your campaign's going. Obviously, you've got the state election also coming up very, very soon. It's all happening in South Australia. Uh, South Australia um, started free, staying free. That, that's our, that's our uh, campaign Beautiful. motto. We like it. We've got, the double, we've got the double electoral cycle, as you know, so huge announcement. We have a candidate for the Legislative Council. He is an absolute amazing new talent in the Liberal Democrats in uh, South Australia. I'm pleased to announce James Hole will lead the Legislative uh, Council ticket in yeah. uh, South Australia. On announcement that that was the case, we've had two staffers from the South Australian Parliament want to come and join the ticket. Wow. I can't, those negotiations are underway right now. Uh, it would be very sensitive uh, for me. This is not the forum for that. But um, if you have me on again, yeah, it, it's just going to be crap-breaking news. <laughs> it's, sort of, it's sort of like the, the political fracturing going on at the moment. They're all jumping ship and they want to come to the Liberal Democrats. Yeah. So um, that, was, that was just this afternoon. So it's all quite fluid. Um, yes, yeah, so... Um, and we've got uh, candidates running for the um, legislative uh, or the House of Assembly. And, um, you know, they'll be strategically placed to do uh, uh, maximum uh, damage to the, uh, the duopoly. Yeah. So, um, so we're, we're all set and ready to go from a standing start. Remember, we're, uh, we're just a newly re-registered uh, party in South Australia. We've, we've got a long track record in this state, but um, now we've got that registration up. Mm. Uh, so if you're talking on social media to anyone, let, let it be said, South Australia is back and we're fighting on two fronts, federal, state and federal. I think, what is it, 38 days to go? Something oh, like that. That's crazy. And so. speaking of social media, I know you've been playing a, bitty, uh, a pretty big meme game. And of course, we love memes around here. Tell us about your little meme team you've got going on. Yeah, so yeah, so every uh, every Tuesday at eight thirty, uh, we got twenty one people that meet, and they've all got specialist roles. And um, you know, on the on the Senate campaign here, um, and uh, you know, one of them, where a new recruit, um, was uh, is uh, fancies himself as a memer. So the the, the backstory to this was, um, I lost the person who was doing this. And um, it was actually my 17-year-old son said, because I was bemoaning, where am I going to get a meme from? He said, get on Twitter, just announce that you've got this role on the, uh, 
uh, on your campaign team. We got seven applications for the job <laughs> and the job was filled in 20 minutes and we haven't looked back. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, so here's the first one. This uh, one's my favourite. This one was actually from one of the candidates who didn't get the job, um, you know, and so it's sort of uh, hitting the duopoly for six, you know, fantastic. Um, this, this one has uh, the second highest um, impressions on social media at the moment. This, this one has uh, the second highest um, impressions on social media at the moment. Yep. So we're happy with that. Isn't this one fantastic? Isn't this one great? <laughs> We've got something weird happening with John Ruddick's uh, camera. What are you doing, John Ruddick? Isn't this one John, please mute yourself. Uh, now this one is a, a South Australian centric, uh, you know, South Australia is the capital of the Senate because we've got the uh, leader of the Senate and the leader of the opposition, uh, both from South Australia. So we, we have a dig at them all uh, in this one. That one speaks for itself. <laughs> 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 uh, no, this is my uh, favourite. <laughs> yeah, that one, that one really, they, they pulled a lot of uh, hate. And so this, here we go. Uh, the yeah. Coalition Labor duopoly, um, straight from the Mandalorian, I think it is. <laughs> uh, lots of street. Uh, now, uh, does anyone know who this is? I'm just asking the panel. Uh, <laughs> no. Do you know what? And if you say no, you are matching 1.7 million uh, South Australians. This is uh, Andrew McLaughlin, Senator for the Liberal Party. No one knows where he is. He's Mr. Yeah. Invisible. <laughs> you know? So we're going to target that guy, man. We've, uh, we've, we've had enough of him. And, you know, um, in, in addition to that, in addition to these uh, memes, which are just, you know, everyone's laughing and having fun, you know, we've got to make these campaigns fun as well. Um, we've just had the, you're going to get an exclusive now um, to a video um, that our mean team has done. Have a watch at this. There's a lot of love in the chat box for this. Love it. How do I get it? Yeah, people Most people it. in the chat asking, how do I get it? Where do I share it? How do I get we'll, it? We'll send it out to everyone. Don't worry about it. You'll all get it. It's going viral. Millions will watch that. <laughs> yep, there's people saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. Where do I get it? we Will do. The more the share, the better. <laughs> And that's it. We've got a lot happening in South Australia. It's just mad time, mad, crazy. Uh, everything's happening. But uh, we're, we're having fun doing it. And listen, a quick shout out. I know she's uh, on the line right now. Elizabeth Lyon. Um, I recruited her today, um, this afternoon. She's been in Canberra at these, um, at these rallies. And she's looked at all the parties and all the factions. And it was just, it was just easy. Liberal Democrats. So... Good one, Elizabeth. Welcome to the team, and uh, you'll be joining us on Tuesday. Excellent. That's it. Good. Well, John Ruddick, I don't know. Have you got memes? How can you how can you compete with that one? What have you been up to? I mean, you look great. We're twinning in our little outfits today. Well, I'm, I'm wearing our campaign material because we're all fired up here about the Willoughby by-election. Yes. Uh, but just before we get to that, I wanted to say how thrilled I am that Canelm's down there in South Australia, in my, my birth state of South Australia. And Canelm and I met 30 years ago in the Mossman Young Liberals. 
And, you know, look, I, I got to know him very well at that time. And, you know, look, I know he's a, firstly, he's got a lot of integrity. He's very intelligent, but he's got, he's got a very important political ingredient, which is energy and enthusiasm. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I am excited about uh, w where things can go there in, in the great state of South Australia. Okay, so really, Kirsty, I want to focus on one thing, which is Willoughby. Mm. Okay, so we're going all out here now. We've had a fantastic volunteer response. We had a lot of fun on Saturday, Super Saturday, last Saturday. We've had some really terrific local people. I mean, we've put it out on social media that people want to help us. Uh, to get in contact with us and yeah some people have really stepped up we've had a terrific uh flyer which has been a a very simple flyer basically saying look if you want to continue with COVID mania do not vote for the liberal democrats mm. i think it's the first campaign i can ever remember where we've actually our our, our campaign propaganda says maybe it shouldn't vote for us okay? <laughs> so don't vote for us if you want it to continue but if you want to send a message to the new south wales government and governments all around australia that we just want to end this, please vote for the Liberal Democrats. Now, look, I, I'm not going to make a prediction about how we go uh, because I'm too invested in it. And I don't know, but it's going to be a good little lit, lit, litmus test. The last time the Liberal Democrats had a serious go in this part of the world, uh, or well, yeah, we sort of ran a candidate at least, was when Joe Hockey resigned in 2015. There was the by election uh, and the Liberal Democrats ran, and we got just over 2% of the primary vote. Mm. Now, look, and, you know, there was no COVID mania or trillion dollar debt at that stage. Um, so <clears throat> let's see how we go. So we're really urging the New South Wales team to, do, to, to roll up their sleeves for this Saturday. We're meeting at the Chatswood Concourse at 7.30. And we're gonna, we're, I think we're going to man every booth. And then, look, yeah. the best part about it is we had a fantastic time at the pub afterwards. Okay, Liberal Democrats, <laughs> Kirsty, I've got to say, Liberal Democrats know how to have a good time better than other political parties. I've, I've never heard that before. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so <laughs> we, had a, we had a lot of fun. And uh, look, let's look, let's let's see how we go. It's it's a reason it's a it's an important test for us, and I, I think we can go pretty good. So that is really the uh, summary from New South Wales tonight. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, Thank now. You. Oh, yes, sorry, Ken. Before roll on, I just want to make one political point to people. This might sound a bit ruthless and whatever. It's time to put collectively our, our, uh, our foot down hard on the throat of the coalition MPs and senators. Mm. So what I mean by that? I mean, we've got to push into, we're going to use social media respectfully, but pointedly to, to, to essentially tweet at them messages at them saying, you have no values, you have no principles, you've mm. sold the country out, you've sold the people out who voted for you, your supporters aren't, you know, going to your fundraisers and paying you money, you know, you're the, you're the problem. Correct. It's really important. We want them to drop their bundles. Yeah. I have no, I, I, I know this is a public forum. I don't mind saying that at all because it's true. And you'll, if you go and look at my tweet this morning, I had a go with the, with the Janet Albrechtson article, very good article, saying, Prime Minister, you're not up to it. So I hit them with it and said, it's all real to be unified, but this is the problem. You stand for nothing. You, you deliver nothing. You, 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 you are the problem. And mm -hmm. you know, that is, you know, this, is a, this is a tough game, politics. We shouldn't be squeamish about it. You know, we've got to keep them on the ropes because this is where, this is where we're going to pick up the, the people who who are decent people who get that they've, they've been letting uh, the country down and we'll get the people joining us instead leaving them behind and we'll get people who'll be prepared to donate to us and, and man polling booths on, on on election day so thank you for indulging me uh, Kirsty but you know I, I believe in playing government uh, politics is a tough game yep. it is, it's a form of warfare. And we have to look at it that way. So please um, you know, do on. your bit, do your bit, take the fight to them. Again, respectfully, nothing yeah. inappropriate or, you know, but, that's you know, it. just making the point that they don't stand for things. And that's the problem. Right. And obviously, if you follow it, hopefully you're following our party Facebook page, Twitter feed, what have you. But also if you go to our website, ldp.org.au, if you go along the top, you'll see election 2022. We have all of our endorsed candidates that are on there for each state. 
Uh, with every one of those candidates, you'll see like if they've got Facebook, if they've got Instagram, if they've got Twitter, and when you, where you can email them. All those contact details are all there on widgets for every single candidate. Hopefully you go along and you follow every single one of those candidates and share far and wide because that's how we get the message across, get the branding across across the country. Um, so now we've had our little updates of what's been going on. We've actually got two special guests tonight, but the first one we're going to bring on is Dr. Peter McLaughlin, uh, who is a Senate candidate in WA. And uh, later on, we also have a special, very special guest with our national president, John Humphreys, uh, who is actually in the chat box if anyone wants to have a little word with him in there. But uh, welcome, Dr. McLaughlin. How are you, Peter? Oh, hi. Hi, Kirsty. Thank you for having me on. And hello to all the panellists and hello to all the people listening, in, particularly to the people in Western Australia. I know there's been quite a few of them hanging out to see this uh, yeah. chat today. There's a, there's a lot in that chat box there. And they've been asking, when's Peter coming on? When's Peter yeah. coming on? Yeah. And you, of course, have your wonderful Gad Swan flag behind you. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, well, this is, uh, this is obviously a take on the Gladstone flag. Uh, rather than the snake in the circle, we've got <laughs> our black swan from the uh, Western Australian flag, but it keeps the, the, the text below, don't tread on me. I mean, that's what our party stands for, small government, don't, don't get in my way. And right. so between the swan and the, the, uh, the party logo, uh, it's been extremely popular here in WA and we've been, uh, we take it along to the protests that we attend and uh, we always get lots of comments. We're uh, starting to merchandise it now. So, uh, yeah. so you can, if you live in WA, you can uh, get in touch with us and we'll get you a flag and uh, you can fly it at home or on the on the protest <laughs> or wherever. Yeah, it's glad that's, to be on. That's yeah. brilliant. Now, Peter, you have been around the party for a few years now and you've been a candidate before, but let's, let us, for all the people that are new and don't know much about you, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and why you're running as a Senate candidate. Uh, well, I've always been on the, this part of the political spectrum, a libertarian uh, viewpoint. Uh, previously was a liberal voter, of course, as many of us were in this party. Uh, some years back, as you know, the Liberal Party kind of fractured the left went to a progressive to a progressive stroke green position, and the right went to a fairly hard new Tory type conservative position, leaving that ground vacant for uh, for true liberals. Um, 2018, uh, I joined the party, having uh, heard a lot about the party from uh, David Linehelm at the time. Uh, I followed David Limehelm's uh, career with interest and uh, his parliamentary speeches, etc. Bought his book and listened to him, and he came over to Perth to speak, and uh, I was very impressed. So I joined the party and became active in the party. Uh, and then uh, Aaron Stonehouse, our then Upper House MP in the State Parliament, asked me to run for Joondalup uh, last year, which I did, and I found that a fantastic experience. And then on this occasion. Uh, I was not planning to run initially, but our lead candidate, Kate Fantanel, uh, asked me if I would consider it. So after I discussed that with my wife, uh, uh, I put my hand up and, uh, and was uh, duly uh, endorsed. Oh, that's wonderful. And I have seen Kate is also in the chat box for any of the other WA folk to message Kate there as well. Um, and also, how can we, like, how do, obviously, you've got your new Facebook page. Um, what, what's that one called, Peter? Yes, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a neophyte when it comes to <laughs> some of the social media stuff. Uh, but anyway, I managed to do it, and, and I tell you, I managed to do it on my own. Excellent. I'm very proud. Uh, so the Facebook page is uh, Dr. Pete, which is um, Kate's... Uh, term for me, Dr. Pete Lib Dem, Senator for WA, all Beautiful. together. And so uh, if you go onto the main party website and navigate your way to, to my, uh, to my uh, candidate page, uh, you'll be able to find a link there to That's that right. Facebook. That's uh, right. It's page. all on the all on the election 2022. Obviously, go to Correct. WA to see um, Peter, yeah. and yeah. we will have it up in the chat box there as well. Peter, there's a comment here from Bradley saying, that he met you on the weekend and had a good chat and it's glad and he's glad to have someone so passionate involved in the party. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I am passionate sometimes and uh, 
I've been interested in political philosophy as well. I mean, I read a lot uh, uh, about uh, back, going back to the 18th century or 19th century, really. So um, someone came up to me at one of the protests the other day and said, oh, we need a Bill of Rights. Mm. And I was able to explain to them the difference between rights and freedoms mm. and uh, explain the dangers that were associated with a Bill of Rights. And at the end of it, uh, he was uh, quite uh, enlightened, if I may say, about, about that particular issue. Mm. Uh, and we do, and, and Kate has actually said in the chat, it's such an honour to have Dr. Pete on the ticket with me. Um, and there's also a comment here from Alice Clay, who is the Victorian State President. And she's actually said, as a former West Australian, it's great to see we're building a presence over there. So, and thank you very much, Peter, for being a big part in that um, in that presence in WA. Well, uh, I have to say, uh, Kirsty, the uh, the WA party uh, was was probably lagging a little bit behind the eastern states until recently. Yes, but uh, with the uh, changes that came in at the beginning of this month with uh, the vaccine mandates and uh, and the show proof of vaccinations and the like, uh, a lot of people have lost their jobs. Um, a lot of people are angry at uh, at uh, the, the protests we've been going to now. Rather than feeling sort of lonely, mm. uh, people come up, particularly with the uh, Gladstone flag, and they they engage us in conversation. They then announce that they just joined the party recently, or they're going to join it now. We, we our membership is increasing, uh, and it was it's looking really really quite exciting now. Mm. Whereas in the past it was a little bit not 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 so. So we're very excited. Uh, we've got our campaign committee up and running. Uh, we're going to contest all 15 of the federal uh, seats that are here in WA in the lower house. We've got uh, uh, more than twice the number of uh, people putting their hands up to be to run as candidates for, for those 15 seats. So we're going through those now. We're a little bit behind the other states in that regard, but hopefully toward the end of next week, we'll have all that done and dusted. That is brilliant. Um, you have actually sparked a little bit of interest about the comment about the Bill of Rights. There's three people now um, saying, can you elaborate? Are you saying a Bill of Rights wouldn't be effective? Well, I understand why people would uh, would say we should have a Bill of Rights, uh, but it's, uh, it's a trap, that one. A freedom is something that's innate, that uh, we get our freedoms, the people get their freedoms because they proclaim them, they assert them, and they defend them. So things like freedom of speech, freedom of association, they don't come from government. Rights, on the other hand, are something that's given to you by somebody else, usually government, and it imposes on the system. If someone's got a right, then someone has a duty to provide you with that. And the example that I gave was something like public housing. It'd be very easy from a green progressive perspective to demand that uh, the right to uh, housing should be there on a bill of rights. Mm -hmm. Well, if you do that, if uh, then everyone has a right to public housing, in which case no one's going to take out a mortgage because you'll just put out your hand for the uh, for the government to provide you with a ha with a house. It'd be an absolute disaster. There'd be huge taxation increases, a massive, massive government and just not what this party said. And the second thing about a Bill of Rights is that the courts are then open to interpret it. And then you go from something well beyond what the parliament intended, uh, opening up a Pandora's box uh, in terms of government uh, expansion of their roles. So yeah, be very careful about what you wish for. It mm. may not be what you wish for. I actually went to oh, maybe Four, four years ago, I went to a La Trobe Uni lecture and Greg Craven, formerly of formerly a Chancellor at ACU, uh, in a debate about a Bill of Rights. And he did an amazing job of certainly convincing me that we do not need a Bill of Rights. And I'm sure that's available on YouTube somewhere to, to look up. It was an excellent, an excellent debate uh, with Greg. Um, but thank you so much, Peter, for joining us tonight. And hopefully you'll stay in the chat box. There. There's a few more little questions and a few more WA folk. Uh, that are in there, wanted to chat to you as well. Thank you so much for joining us on Libby Chat. Okay, okay. thank you everyone, and uh, we'll catch you up. Bye. Thanks Peter. Thanks, Peter. We look forward to following Peter's campaign, Peter and Kate's campaign for the Senate in WA. Um, now we'll just he wait. Terrific.
He is great. And I know Kate is is very excited to have him as her running mate as well. So it's going to be a great campaign over there. And, and people are here saying it's, it's great as well that uh, WA is building that presence back up. After losing Aaron Stonehouse at the last election, it was obviously a bit of a bit of a downer for the party over there. So it's um it's pretty exciting to see that building back up again. Now, before we get to our uh, next guest, John Humphreys, uh, John Ruddick, have you got a blistery history for us tonight? I do, Kirsty. I hope my internet connection stays up. But look, I want to talk about a little incident which is called the hope didn't blunder. So everybody thinks the first Prime Minister of Australia was Edmund Barton. And what very few people know is we actually were, were on track to have another guy called William Lyon as our Prime Minister. I just want to walk through how that happened. It's quite an entertaining little story in Australian history, which sadly is almost entirely forgotten, but it was a very big deal at the time. So in the 1890s, this country was consumed by Federation politics. And Federation was very much a Victorian driven enterprise. And Victoria always had Tasmania and South Australia supportive of the project very much. Western Australia was sort of 50-50. Queensland was also iffy. And, but New South Wales was sort of the, they couldn't have Federation without New South Wales, the mother colony, because we were like the biggest colony and that's you know, where the whole thing started. And uh, so now what happened was, in 1899, we had our second referendum on whether we should unite, and that was approved. At this time, it was also approved in New South Wales. And so that, that meant it was a done deal. So then we had to, um, we had our constitution in place, and it was all, and then it went, then the, they went to London and got signed off by the British Parliament in mid 1900. And then they said that the, the, the Commonwealth of Australia would start on the 1st of January, 1901, the first year of the new century. And the, uh, the, the Australians were very conscious of what had happened to their, basically our twin cousin in Canada, a generation earlier. Canada went through the same process in the 1860s, had a peaceful independence from Britain, what they called confederation, which is actually better than federation, but anyway. Now, what the, now what, when, when the Canadians had become independent and before they had their first election, they had to appoint somebody but to be the prime minister because there was no parliament. So we couldn't have a traditionally elected prime minister. And what they simply did in Canada was the British said, okay, well, whoever's the premier of the biggest state can be the prime minister on the first day that Canada becomes independent. And then immediately after they'll have, like uh, three months later, they'll have a a federal election to, to have a, a parliament and they can elect a prime minister in the normal way. So what they agreed in London was that they would send out our first governor general who was called Lord Hopeton, who would arrive in Sydney two weeks before, the, there he is, Mr. Hopeton, Lord Hopeton. He would arrive in Sydney two weeks before uh, uh, January the 1st and he would come out here and at his discretion, he would appoint somebody to be the prime minister. Hmm. Now there was a, now, everybody thought, or well, certainly Edmund Barton and Alfred Deakin, who had sort of been running the whole show of Federation, and had sort of, the whole project of Federation was to make Alfred Deakin the Prime Minister. That's what the whole, he ran the whole thing. He was like the control freak of the whole thing. And, but he was from Victoria, and they, the Victorians accepted that to get New South Wales across the line, that the first Prime Minister would have to be from New, from New South Wales. And so... Uh, <clears throat> And they desperately wanted Edmund Barton, who was from New South Wales. But Edmund Barton was out of parliament at the time, was officially a nobody. So Lord Hopeton arrives in Sydney and he was sick. He got some tropical disease in India. And, uh, and he just said, look, and, and everyone's lobbying him about who should be the prime minister. And he said, look, I'm just going to do what the Canadians did. And he announced uh, about a week before Christmas, he said, look, we're going to make William Lyon the first prime minister of Australia. Here he is. And because he was the Premier of New South Wales at the time. Now, then what happened was, and, 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 and Edmund Barton, sorry, Ed Barton and Deacon assumed that if Lyon was offered the job, that he would decline the job because he had been anti-Federation, like a lot of people in New South Wales were. Uh, but of course, you know, he gets offered to be the Prime Minister of the great new country, Australia. Of course, he doesn't say no. Of course, he says, yes, I'll take it, of course. <laughs> so then Barton and Deacon go into overdrive for a week to undermine it. And it was 
just like Scott Morrison, how he gets the leadership, you know, <laughs> and, and, and controls the party. Okay. And he so so they waited for a week, they're undermining Lyon, and then they got, and then Lyon had to get a cabinet together, um, and and then they they Lyon, Barton and Deacon just like little these little rats, they just went around and they just said, don't don't join his don't join his cabinet, don't join his cabinet. So then eventually, poor old, and there was a lot of media leaks, and the whole of Australia was absolutely gripped by it. Who's going to be our first prime minister on January the first? And 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 it really and it was a big big. You read the newspapers at the time, and it was a huge deal. And uh, but eventually, poor old William Lyon surrendered. He had to say, "Okay, look, I've been undermined by all these bastards, and I will say I won't accept it." This is on Christmas Eve. And then then they said very. Then the the Governor General, Lord Hopeman, very reluctantly said, "Okay, well, I suppose the guy has to give it to the guy who's been orchestrating." all of this political dissension, Edmund Barton. So then he becomes the prime minister and here he is, a little photo of our little mate. Now then, uh, the thing to know about Edmund Barton is he uh, was only the prime minister for about two years. As soon as Alfred Deacon could knife his best mate, that's exactly what he did. And he got rid of him after two years. Hmm. They created the high court to give him a job, to get, uh, to get rid of him. Wow. So anyway, my point is, it got Australian federal politics, it got Australian federal politics off to a bad start. And they had seven prime ministers in the first 10 years. Uh, and But the prime minister through the whole 10 years was effectively Alfred Deacon. He was he was the puppet master running mm -hmm. the whole show. I'll do a blistery history on Alfred Deacon one day, Kirsty, because uh, be he's sort of, you know, really set us straight for a long time. But anyway, that's it for the, this week. Well, and as David says in here, and it hasn't improved since um, Australian Parliament, so... <laughs> Thanks for that, John. Um, now we'll just wait for Campbell and Canelm to come back in. Uh, and we're going to actually welcome our very special guest, our national president, Mr. John Humphreys, who is sitting there in the grey on the other side of the world. Yes, g'day, g'day, everyone uh, from the Netherlands. So I don't know what time it is there, but it's 10 a.m. here Hi, John. Uh, on the wrong side of the world. <laughs> Are we, do we look upside down to you? Always. <laughs> that doesn't matter where I am. Now, first of all, we should probably you should probably explain why you're in the Netherlands. Oh well, I, my wife suffers from Dutch, so uh, I, the over here now, so that the, the kids can see the other half of the family uh, and meet their grand grandma and, and great grandma and, and the rest of it. So that seems like a fair compromise. My wife's walking in the background now, but she will studiously avoid the camera at all costs. And she's probably <laughs> have to this already. Um, <laughs> thank you. Love you Luke. Um, yeah, so that's why I'm in the Netherlands, but I'll be back uh, next month. So I'll be back soon yeah. and still working every morning here, every evening there to, uh, to help these great uh, future senators get elected. Beautiful. Now, John, obviously we have brought you in here tonight uh, because we do have the High Court case uh, next week about our name challenge. I get a lot of emails about this. We see a lot of comments online, people wondering what's going to happen. Uh, is the party going to collapse? Will our votes go to the Liberal Party? What on earth, what on earth going on? Can you please explain it for us, John? Yeah, well, there are some very weird conspiracy theories, and I, I don't know how to respond to them because I don't always understand what it is they're trying to say. But I'll start with just the, the simple facts. Firstly, if you want to get <clears throat> a simple written version of this, ldp.org.au uh, forward slash name, and you can get the story of, of how the party was named, uh, some of the back and forth that's happened over the last 20 years. And it's probably worth touching on some of that. We, we sometimes get accused, as the Liberal Party has, of trying to uh, crib their name, trying to steal their name. Uh, the, and we do, you know, Liberal Democrats has the word liberal in it, uh, but it's actually it wasn't even true 20 years ago. The, the genesis of our name didn't come from trying to steal the Liberal Party name. It came from the, the several factors, the main one of which is I think we are truly the embodiment of the liberal democratic classical liberal uh, tradition, the, the oldest living political tradition uh, in history. So it seems perfectly accurate to name yourself after what you actually believe. Uh, secondly, if anything, we were more inspired, I was more inspired in naming the party actually by, and I maybe shouldn't admit this, but by the Democrats. Uh, at the time, was, they're long forgotten now, but at the time, the Democrats were the third party, right? The Greens were a small nothing party at the time. The Democrats were the third party uh, of choice, the balance of power party. They had started as a somewhat liberalish party, uh, and by then, by 20 years ago, they had basically evolved into just another left-wing party, right, which so often happens, right? So uh, they had evolved into a left-wing party, and I wanted to come in and say, well, we are now the standard bearer of actual liberal version 
of, of Democrats' politics. You know, we're the, we're the liberal version of the Democrats, a liberal third party alternative, uh, meaning classical liberal, not liberal party. Uh, so that the, the idea that we're trying to steal their name wasn't true to start with. Uh, I think there is a, a healthy vote out there from people who like the idea of liberalism. I think the word liberalism has a positive connotation for a lot of people, not because they associate it with, uh, with ScoMo or all the other sellouts and hacks in the illiberal party that's falsely named, uh, but because there are still uh, a significant portion of Australians who like liberalism, live and let live, that basic idea. So I think uh, it is an, an accurate name and an appropriate one, and it's one we've had for over 20 years now. Uh, so we, we were only federally registered under this name in 2008, but we were registered first in the ACT over 20 years ago and have kept that registration continuously uh, as the Liberal Democratic Party and the Liberal Democrats. Uh, the Liberal Party has complained from time to time, as did the Democrats, uh, but I, I thought we'd got past that. I thought we'd gone past their, their fatwa against uh, minor parties and other people uh, trying to use legitimate political terms. Mm. Uh, until something seemed to have happened last year. Now, I, I don't want to point the finger or make accusations, but I will note that at the exact same time that David Limbrick and Tim Quilty were going gangbusters and David Limbrick was declared the real opposition leader in Victoria and the party was riding that wave uh, of, of success in Victoria and then Campbell Newman and John Ruddock and Ross Cameron joined the party and, and we had a massive influx of members and an influx of cash and an influx of, of excitement in the party. Uh, Coincidentally, the next day, the Liberal Party teamed up with the Labor Party to rush through legislation in lightning speed. No, no committee, no consideration, rushed it through both houses in a week. And they did it to introduce entirely unprecedented laws that exist nowhere in the world that give established party a monopoly on generic political terms. Now, I understand some people out there don't particularly like our party. I get that. But this, that sentence I just said should worry everyone, even if you didn't particularly like our party. Mm. That they rush through, uh, they rush through legislation that's unprecedented to give themselves a monopoly. And it's not just uh, that the Liberal Party's given themselves a monopoly on the word liberal. They've given established parties a monopoly on any word currently used. So no other party can use the word uh, Christian. No other party can use the word socialist. No other party can use the word labor. No other party can use the word secular. No other party can use the word pirate or senior. Mm. Or, or there's any number of words now that uh, can only have one official version which is nutty. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's nutty in general. Uh, I think the example of the socialists is particularly a good example. There's three socialist party registered in Australia and they're all very different sorts of socialists that hate each other. You, you may know that about socialists. They have uh, maybe a bit like libertarians, more factions than people. Um, but the only thing that the, uh, you know, the, the Leninist will hate more than a capitalist would be a Trotskyist, right? They, they hate each other. The, the idea of forcing them all into one party and only one party can use the word socialist I think makes a mockery of this whole law they've introduced. So anyway, uh, we have not stood idly by. This is a, a direct attack on you know, freedom of political speech and obviously an attack directed at our party. Mm -hmm. So we've decided to fight back, which I think we we're really kind of obliged to, to, to fight back and not take this line down. Uh, we've taken this to the High Court. Uh, and the argument there is that this law is an unprecedented law that exists nowhere else in the world and nowhere in our history. Uh, is an attack on the implied right to freedom of political speech. Now, we don't have a Bill of Rights in Australia. We don't have freedom of speech written into, into our constitution. But the High Court long ago interpreted our constitution as giving us an implied right to fr uh, freedom of political speech. Uh, and we think there's a pretty good case to be made that this law that the government's introduced has crossed the line uh, mm. in terms of in impinging our ability to use generic political words, not just us, but especially us. Um, so that's the case coming up. Uh, a lot of people would have heard that case is coming up. It is set now for next week on a Tuesday, so six days away. So it's getting very close. This being, it's been a slow burn for a while in the background. We've all been working away very hard, especially JR and, and myself and a few others. Uh, but it, it's now really coming to a head. So I would encourage people to keep an eye out for this. Uh, regardless of what you wish to happen or think we should have done, uh, something very big is dropping next Tuesday. Uh, so please keep an eye out for this high court case. Now, I should say the COVID mania has meant, of course, that they shut the courts uh, so that no one can actually go in and, and watch it live themselves. But the, the, court, the court hearing will happen on Tuesday. Within a couple of days after that, we should hear a result. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a, a, a very big moment. Now, one of the things that people get worried about is, is what happens if we lose. Now, I think we'll win. I think we've got a good case. 
Uh, and I'm looking forward to it because then uh, we get to do a, a lap of honor and David versus Goliath, you know, standing up against the government using all the power of the government solicitors. Uh, so I think we've got a good chance. But if, of course, one thing people worry about is what happens if we lose. I think some of the rumor mill says if we lose, we get deregistered and all our votes somehow automatically pass to someone else. I think that's the, the, the rumor of the day. Uh, correct me if yes. I'm wrong. Oh, I hear that a lot. Yes. A couple of things to note. There is no chance that we're going to be deregistered. That's not an option. Uh, so firstly, I think we'll win. Secondly, if we don't win, there is a very good chance that we go to the election with our current name anyway, uh, for several reasons that I can't go into here. The absolute worst case scenario is that we stay registered with a slightly different name. So there is no option on the table of us not existing at this election. There is no option on the table of our votes secretly going elsewhere. I should mention also there is there is no way for our votes to secretly go elsewhere. That's just not how democracy works, right? People determine their own votes and their own preferences. So there is no such thing as that weird conspiracy theory. Uh, but you don't have to worry about that because there is no option of us not being on the ballots. We will be running. Uh, and I think it's very likely we'll be, well, I, I'd say we'll, we'll be running as the Liberal Democrats. Mm. Uh, that is that is what I think is, well, I, I can't guarantee the future. So it's 99% likely. Uh, so, uh, and the other 1% isn't deregistration. So fear not. Uh, but anyway, the high court, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in the high court. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, it comes down to various things that would take too long to explain, and I probably wouldn't explain them correctly anyway. Uh, but uh, we've been led to believe by several people smarter than us that uh, we've got a, a better than 50% chance, but nothing's known in the high court. Uh, but either way, it's a very interesting day, a very important day for the party. And I'd encourage you all to, uh, to, 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 to tune in, to look out for it, to get involved in the discussion. Uh, and let's make sure people are paying attention to this moment when David takes on Goliath. Mm. Uh, and there's another David in here who's actually said, maybe we should call ourselves the really real Liberal Democrats. Um, now, obviously, JR, you've been heavily involved in this as well, as, as John Humphreys has said. What, what is your take on what you think might happen on Tuesday? Oh, well, look, I thought that was a very good summary from John. Um, uh, look, I just wanted to make a couple of, just add a couple of little points. You know, in Switzerland, which is a fabulous democracy, there are three major parties that use the word liberal. One of them is green liberal. Um, and I think the other one is something like conservative liberal or, you know, and that no one cares about it. Okay, mm. in Denmark there are two political parties that use the word liberal. So as John Humphrey said, you know this is unprecedented around the world. I think when the Liberal Party knew that myself and Ross Cameron had defected, I thought the Liberal. I think the Liberal Party said, "Fantastic, see you later, troublemakers. <laughs> we don't want you anymore." I think the, the big turning point was when the former Premier of Queensland defected. Yes, yes it came along very quickly after that. Now, yes. when they first proposed the legislation. The crossbench came out and said they would oppose it. And I want to I want to thank the Greens and I want to thank Pauline Hanson and Jackie Lambie. They all the entire crossbench opposed it. And we simply assumed that the Labor Party would also oppose it. But no, 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 no. At the last moment, you know, the, the Labor Party wanted they wanted to kill off the Democratic Labor Party. Democratic Labor Party is part of Australian political history, uh, going back to the 1950s. They're not a big, they're not a big deal now. No one talks about them much. I think they've had a member or two here and there. Um, so now, and now I know some people have said, um, well, yeah, has this cost us a lot of money? Now, look, obviously going to the High Court costs money. The thing is, we were very fortunate to have a donation from somebody who absolutely would not have donated to this party, who has basically funded most of it, uh, almost all of it. And we were very grateful for that. Uh, so that, that's something, and, and you know, people said that this may have been a distraction. Look, it's certainly been a bit of a distraction to myself and John Humphreys, but I think basically the party has sort of, you know, just kept, doing what we would have done anyway. So how are we going, how, how's it going to go? Well, look, I mean, uh, look, our legal, we, we, we've, got, we've got three levels of lawyers involved. We've got a solicitor, a junior barrister, a senior barrister. A senior barrister is, is uh, you know, people tell, keep telling us he's the best in the country, Brett Walker, uh, uh, you know, and so, uh, and they all seem pretty positive, but we have also spoken to people who are supporters who are not, don't have an incentive to tell us, give us hopes. They've looked at these documents. They say, look, this is a, the High Court does not like politicised legislation. The High Court looks at these things. Now, this is clearly politicised legislation. Mm. Now, now it is, it is, I think, only about 150 times since Federation 
that the High Court has actually said that when the Commonwealth has passed a law and the High Court, which it's got the power to do, the High Court has come out and said, no, that is an unconstitutional law. Okay, so it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And we have this, that we, the, the court has established, it's not a flimsy establishment, it's a settled establishment, that the Australian, that there is an implied right to the freedom of political communication. There is this thing called the McCloy test, which, which spells out whether a law is legal, whether it's constitutional under this McCloy test. It's a bit technical, you, you can look it up on the internet. Yeah, I think, I think we passed this test. So if we lose, if we lose, uh, you know, you know, John seems confident we can, we can hopefully still use our name for this coming election. We're still going to be the Lib Dems one way or, or another. We just have to tweak our name. But I like to think that this case is not just about the Liberal Democrats. It's really about, you know, political freedom for the next 100 years. I mean, do we want to have a, a, a legal system where it says you can have one party with the word seniors in it? So you can have the seniors party. But you can't have green seniors and you can't have conservative seniors. Mm. You can just have one. Now, it doesn't make much sense. And look, I don't fall for the line that the Australian people are getting confused. I think the I think the Australian people are much smarter than the political class gives them credit for. So all I can say is next Tuesday, uh, tune into John Ruddick's Twitter account. <laughs> I uh, look, I'll, I'm not going to be saying look, it's look, looking for a nick, but I will be able to. That that's where really where we're going to find out because I'll sort of be there, um, you know, following it very very closely. And you know, win, lose or draw, you know doesn't change too much at all. And so, you know, let's uh, say, our, say our prayers to the libertarian gods the night before, please, everybody. <laughs> uh, and there so is I, a question. Of course, it's, was... it's far, bit from, far be it from me to, to disagree with anyone. I, I never do that. Uh, but <laughs> to a bit, we did actually have a, a, um, a range of different donors. It was a pretty good, uh, pretty good effort from people. None of that money has come out of the campaign buckets. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the important point. But there was a, a range of people uh, pitching in for a range of reasons, uh, which is was great to see. Uh, Someone JR has asked, was it Elon Musk? Uh, yes, definitely it was Elon Musk. <laughs> there's, a, there's a range of people and we're not name dropping them. People can decide if they want to out themselves as a donor towards that. Uh, but we're, we're going nowhere near that. Uh, thanks a lot, JR. Now, the mention of the distraction, and that is, that is a good point. But I think that the point to make here is that it's the coalition that chose this distraction. They chose in the lead up to an yes. election when our freedoms are under assault, when there are really important things on the table here, when there's COVID mania, when there's this push to the crazy push to net zero, when, there's a, when our debt is ballooning to over a trillion dollars, the Liberal parties and the Labor Party joining them, their priority was an attack on minor parties. Their priority was an unprecedented uh, claim of monopoly over generic political terms. That was their priority. They put this on the table. It is a distraction. They should never have done it. We fought back to defend ourselves. We didn't put this issue on the table. But yes, it, I mean, it is a distraction and they should be condemned for putting this distraction on the table. And there are so much more important things for politicians to be paying attention to. And it was at the height. The legislation was rammed through very quickly at the height of the Delta wave. You know, the thing that's meant to have sort of, you know, stop Western civilization in its tracks. Oh, but they, they, they're meant to be addressing this major crisis, but gee, they found time to just <laughs> ram this thing through the parliament super quick. That's exactly right. Um, now, Peter does ask, uh, with Brett Walker appearing for the Lib Dems, any idea who is appearing for the Commonwealth and have the Liberal Party intervened at all? Uh, well, I mean, whether the Liberal Party's intervened depends on whether you think there is any such thing as corruption in the public service. And I will just no. leave that as a comment for everyone to make their own opinion about. Uh, of course, I have no opinion about such a, uh, a, a defamation worthy uh, topic. <laughs> um, so the, the, the government's being represented by the Solicitor General. So they're taking this very seriously, which we are led to believe is an indicator that they're worried about the strength of their case. But again, we're, we're prognosticating about things that are outside of our ken. So uh, it's, it's up to the lawyers now uh, and you know, tune in next Tuesday to, to find out more. I've seen some other questions coming in to the chat group. Uh, somebody asked who owns the word party. Good question. The legislation <laughs> carves that out. Uh, it it yeah. says that words like uh, party, coalition, alliance, things like that, um, that you can't have a monopoly on, on words that sound like group, group, mm -hmm. party, alliance. So that, that's wow. been carved out. A few other people have made some suggestions that uh, may, may be in jest, but I've got to point out this legislation also says anything that can be uh, interpreted as being a derivative uh, of a word currently used is also banned. 
Mm. So uh, they have, they've really gone all out on preventing uh, a lot of serious alternatives there. So we're not, uh, we're not diving into the discussion of alternative names here because we're very confident we'll be the Liberal Democrats for this election. Uh, but uh, yeah, stay tuned next Tuesday, big day for the party. Uh, make other people aware too. There is, uh, we have no reason not to have the country watching as David takes on Goliath. Uh, it is a fight that uh, it, was, it was worth us doing. And either we take out Goliath or, you know, the bully tries to stomp on the small party while we fight back. Either way, we've done our duty to democracy uh, and it's good if people are watching as this happens. So feel free to like and share any comments you see about the court case coming up. Beautiful. And I'm sure John Ruddick will be live tweeting all day long. Uh, now, John, just a quick one before you leave. There's a question here from Chris. Is Holland as COVID crazy as Australia? Uh, well, I... I've shied away from getting too much involved in the debates here, firstly, because uh, I don't understand the language very well. Um, but also, it's not my country. Um, my, my social circle here is a bit more COVID maniac than my social circle back home, and I need to be polite because I'm in their country. Uh, there, there was lockdowns when I first landed. Uh, the lockdowns are relaxing now. There are a couple of anti-lockdown parties that are, uh, seem to be rising in the polls. Uh, which is interesting to watch. And there's an election coming up here in about a month's time. So I guess that'll give us a good indication of whether those anti-lockdown parties are rising in the Netherlands. Um, there, a lot of the politics here is uh, the, tr the trends and trajectories are, are somewhat similar to they are in the Anglosphere. I, I've, I've come to appreciate Netherlands is like the, the, the de facto extra cousin from the Anglosphere. They're the closest non-Anglo country to the Anglosphere, uh, I think culturally uh, and politically. Um, and it'll be interesting to watch. But at the moment, yeah, the dominant narrative is still the same as the dominant narrative in our country, be scared first. But I think it's, I think people are starting to have enough. There's semi-regular protests and the alternative parties are, are rising. By the way, Holland isn't a country. Uh, Holland is, is two provinces out of 12. Uh, the country's called the Netherlands. It would like calling Australia Queensland. It's, it's not the same thing. But anyway, it's a common mistake. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, John Humphreys, for joining us tonight. It's been really informative. And yes, there's definitely still questions in the chat, um, but we are going to have to wrap that up. Thank you so much. I'll stick around the chat and answer some yes. now, but I will duck off the video. So good luck, all. That would be beautiful. Um, yeah, well, I found that really informative. And, and like, as I said, I, we get a lot of questions about it. I see a lot on social media. So yes, John, I know you'll be very busy on Tuesday following everyone and you'll be listening on your phone um, for what's happening on in, in the High Court because obviously you can't actually go to Canberra. Um, well, can I just say this? Can I just say this? So uh, my name is, uh, it's called Ruddick versus the Commonwealth. That was because it was originally going to be the party, but we're not, in, we're not like most political parties, we're not incorporated. Mm -hmm. So even though my name might be on it, uh, the truth is John Humphreys has done an enormous amount of heavy lifting here. And he's you know, really been the, the driving force here. And I, it's been terrific to have him, uh, you know, basically um, driving the car. Mm. Well, and it, it is pretty cool to uh, see that piece of paper with Ruddick versus the Commonwealth, that's for sure. I think you'll, you should frame I, it. I, it's got a nice ring to it. It's got a nice <laughs> ring to it. Yes, you should like frame it, yes. that and put it in the, in the pool room somewhere there, John. Um, now there's, a, there's a couple of little questions in here. We have obviously been answering most of them throughout the night. Uh, well, actually, Trevor says Ruddick versus the Commonwealth, you legend. Um, uh, and Cara says, well, well done and good on you, John. Um, I'm John Ruddick and John Humphreys, I'm putting that towards. Um, here is a question from Jacob. Do you guys enjoy being politicians? And obviously, Campbell is the one with the experience on that. I have a dream of being a politician one day. Did you and would you recommend studying law? And when do we get hats like John's? I'll answer that one. <laughs> um, from a personal perspective, um, uh, yeah, my involvement, um, well, I need, I need that like a hole in the head. I've got a great <laughs> business, great business partners, um, but I'm doing this to serve the people of Queensland and the country mm. because of the uh, hopeless uh, non-entities that are in our parliaments. And, uh, you know, I've been stirred to action. I didn't want to be involved in politics again. Uh, and look, I just say to people, you know, look, what we need in this country in our parliaments are people who have had real world experience. I mean, it sounds a bit like a platitude, but it's true. We need real world experience. We need people who want to go into our parliaments to get stuff done, whether it be, you know, infrastructure, social reform, you know, ensuring our liberties, ending surveillance, whatever it is, 
um, that's what we need. What we've got are a bunch of no-hopers that are there because they love politics. They love debate. They love being the media. They love the points of order. They love the games, the machinations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm afraid we'll get those people along the way, but we, we need people who actually want outcomes as well, are particularly right. interested in outcomes. You know, they're, they're interested in the, the, the making of the sausage than getting sausages off the end of the production line. So mm -hmm. that's what, you know, really cheeses me off about our political class in this country. And what about you, Kanelm? Did you have boyhood dreams of being a prime minister one day? Uh, <laughs> um, well, look, way back in my 20s, uh, I was an activist. Uh, that's true. Um, and when I left at around 33, I vowed I wouldn't get involved again. And, you know, um, I've employed 1,470 people. I've had businesses in New Zealand, Singapore, um, United States. But like Cam, I need this like a hole in the head. You know, uh, my hobby was supposed to be growing figs in the Adelaide Hills. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, and, and I know it's a cliche. I know it is. But I'm really doing this because I have three teenage children. We have moved back from the United States. And this is not the country. Uh, that I promised them, mm. and, and and it really is just as simple as that. Um, if if I'm elected, um, I, I will be an absolute machine in the Senate's Senate Estimates Committee. Mm. I mean, if you think, you saw David Lionhelm, yeah. you know, think like three times more. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I work like sixteen hours a day to research for government waste and, and corruption. Uh, because they will have taken me away from my family and, and uh, you know, what I wanted to do with my life, but it will be necessary. Yep. Well, and on that note, we are going to finish up with our next video from our Freedom Manifesto. And this one is starring Mr David Limbrick, MP in Victoria. Roll the tape. We will flatten the curve of taxation. Don't watch this video if you think it's okay to have your tax dollars pay the Prime Minister a salary higher than the President of the United States. Come on, man! Don't watch this if you like paying a company tax well above the OECD average. And don't watch this if you love to stifle progress by taking money from small businesses and giving it to the government to waste. Hi, I'm David Limbrick, a Member of Parliament for the Liberal Democrats here in Victoria. And I want to cut taxes because the government has taken enough from you already. In this video, I want to talk to you about the fourth policy in the Liberal Democrats' Freedom Manifesto, low, flat taxes. Australia has one of the highest company tax rates in the world, and we spend those tax dollars on the stupidest things imaginable, like corporate welfare and subsidies. The OECD company tax rate is 23%. Australia sits at 30%. The Liberal Democrats want to bring this down to a flat rate of 20% across the board. If you're making less than $40,000, you'll pay zero tax. A flat tax simplifies and makes the economy more efficient and dynamic. By lowering company tax rates to a competitive level, we'll attract better businesses and investors to Australia. No longer will our best and brightest jump ship and set up successful businesses in countries with better incentives. We can keep our entrepreneurs here. The reality is that with a lower tax rate, businesses grow and prosper. Think about this. If a business with $100 million profit gets a tax cut to 20%, that business would now have an extra $10 million to open new stores, develop new products, and employ more staff. That means jobs for you and your family and better products and services for us all. In the long term, this policy will mean that businesses can employ more staff, pay higher wages, and they can stop wasting time and resources on clever ways to minimise their tax. If you want an Australia of low tax and high opportunity, then vote Liberal Democrats. To learn more, head to our website, www.ldp.org.au. Authorised by John Humphreys for the Liberal Democratic Party, Mount Waverley, Victoria. <laughs> I, I thought that was great I think these videos are getting better better everyone and there's a lot oh. of love again a lot of love for David obviously 
Um, so yes, everyone, this will be on our YouTube channel. Share, share, share away. It'll be on our Facebook and YouTube. Share it around the place. These are just quick, punchy little ads for people that don't want to read the full manifesto. And it's the way that we can share the message around the country as well. Now, just to wrap up tonight, anything else from yourselves, John Canelm Campbell? Willoughby, if you live in New South Wales, see you 7.30 a.m. Chatswood Concourse. And let's let's go get some votes. Good luck, New South Wales. Good luck, New South Wales. Good luck, Sam Gunning in <clears throat> Willoughby, an excellent candidate. Now, oh, for, for for yes, we need to mention his, the actual. Candidate. He's a great guy. I got to know him very well on Sunday. <laughs> I haven't mentioned him. I feel bad about it. He's a top bloke. He very, is a top bloke. He's got he's, Hollywood good looks. He um, does. Yeah, he's, he's, he's been he's, a counsellor. Yeah, well, he, well is. he's he is a cool dude. I promise you, he's a smart guy too. I like him a lot. So sorry I didn't mention you, Sam. He's a, a very good looking man and on the North Sydney Council up there as well. Uh, obviously, any party event, you can go to the website. Um, we haven't been able to answer all of the questions, but you know, if you have any further questions, you can uh, leave a comment on the website or you can email in at contact at LDP. Kirsty, Kirsty, just yeah, just really, really quickly, Kirsty, we've got a, a, a barbecue meetup of James um, in South Australia on Sunday. Uh, James, James holds the Legislative Council um, uh, candidate and I'm obviously the Senate candidate. There's going to be scores of people there, so it's going to be fantastic. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and obviously, join the party, donate, put your hand up to volunteer. We need volunteers all across the countries to help with these candidates in their campaigns, obviously spreading the message. If there's no local House of Reps candidate in your area for the federal election, Certainly, you've got your Senate candidates you can help work for. Go to their website, ldp.org.au. On there as well, you can see all of our candidates. Um, you can see all of our Freedom Manifesto policies and the videos that are all up, as well as go to the Lib Dems shop where you can buy wonderful polo shirts like what John and I are modelling tonight. Um, there's also T-shirts. There has been, there is a bit of a backlog at the moment because we, we ran out. Um, there are more coming in very, very soon. So don't worry if you make your order. There's still everything coming through. There's also stickers and uh, caps and bucket hats and a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, thank you all again for joining us tonight. We shall see you next week. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us for Liberty Chat, brought to you by the Liberal Democrats. Visit ldp.org.au for more info.